All right, everybody, welcome to the video. Today we are reacting to Oversimplified The Cold War Part 2, finishing off the series. Um, last time on Part 1, where we ended was basically uh, we, we had sort of like the two sides, East and West, sort of fighting for supremacy. Uh, both sides trying to sort of you know spread and increase their sphere of influence and so you have sort of like the west uh, with the u.s uh, western uh, western europe the uk you know sort of like all the nato countries on one side and then you have you know um, russia and it's you know satellite states the soviet union china uh, and north korea and sort of on the other on the other side of the equation and uh, both sides really uh, trying to spread their ideals throughout the world. Throughout the world, it's more like an ideological fight. One side, you know, trying to spread democracy and freedom, you know, whether people want it or not. And the other side, sp trying to spread communism and the the ideas that come with that, uh, whether people want it or not. And uh, so where we left off uh, was uh, Khrushchev finally building uh, uh, the Berlin Wall. Uh, where uh, before you had people on east on the East Berlin side being able to go to West Berlin and then travel freely between the two, and then people started to and then the problem with that was that they were able to see um, how people on the western side were living compared to them. So people would travel to West Berlin, see the economic prosperity, see how people were doing well, and then eventually they didn't want to go back. They just wanted to stay in the West. And this obviously is, is a real trouble for, for Russia because Berlin became sort of emblematic of the troubles um, with uh, communism, of the faults of communism, where you have economic prosperity in the west and in the east everyone's in economically troubled and downtrodden right and obviously that's a bad that's a that's a bad look so eventually khrushchev elected to to elected to build this wall so people in the east can't go to the west and so they kind of kept trapped and, and closed in um so that's pretty much where we left off again the again it's, it's the cold war so because of the advent of the atomic bomb the two sides don't really want to go into a real full-on war or a real kinetic war. So everything was more covert, you know, espionage, secrets, both sides spying on each other. They found other ways to compete, like, you know, um, you know, the space race and things like that. But mostly it was all ideo ideo uh, ideological and proxy wars where, you know, they would fight in other countries, endorse certain factions in other countries, you know, whether that's Iran or Tunisia or whatever. Um, as opposed to actually engaging in a, in a real war with each other. So, with all that said, let's jump in. Nuclear apocalypse. Shocked by the CIA's intrusive methods for putting down socialism in Latin America, a certain Fidel Castro met with a certain Che Guevara in a bar in Mexico City, and the two of them decided they should grow some awesome beards and overthrow the Cuban government, which is exactly what they did. Cuba had been America's summer mm. playground, and America didn't like seeing a communist regime being set up in its own backyard. Right. So the U.S. immediately began training up Cuban exiles to invade Cuba and overthrow Castro. However, as the day of the operation came closer, Kennedy wanted to conceal any U.S. involvement in the plan, so he massively scaled back American air support. When it hide the fact that the U.S. was interfering for America. in but other countries' politics. Still an impending U.S. threat to his regime. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev had a lot of medium-range nuclear missiles that couldn't reach America, but they could if they were positioned, say, on an exotic Caribbean mm. island off the coast of Florida. Hey, I'm a communist who hates America. You're a communist who hates America. You know what that means? We should fall in love. So uh, put missiles. You set your missiles up put there. Russian missiles oh, in, in, no, no, in missiles right. in That's Cuba. That's a better idea. Be still, my beating heart. On October 14th, 1963, like a forward position. Over Cuba noticed something strange. Sir, you need to look at this photograph. You're right. That's the cutest dog I've ever seen. Sir, I was referring more to the Soviet missiles. America freaked out as they realized what was going on. They were right. completely vulnerable and they had to act fast. They Damn. knew that airstrikes or an invasion of Cuba would likely mean nuclear war with the Soviet Union. So Kennedy came up with another idea. A blockade. The U.S. Navy announced it would stop and search any Soviet ships heading to Cuba and would sink any that did not comply. In response, the Soviet put its military into full combat readiness. The U.S. did the same and began drawing up plans for an attack 
on Cuba. Things were escalating fast, and both right. superpowers were getting ready for World War III. Emergency communications between the two sides broke down as Khrushchev rejected Kennedy's demands for the missiles to be removed. And for the first time in history, U.S. Strategic Air Command moved to DEFCON 2. DEFCON 1 means nuclear war. The Soviet shot down a U-2 spy plane over Cuba. A Soviet nuclear submarine in the Caribbean mistakenly believed war had already broken out, and two of the senior officers gave the go-ahead to fire its nuclear torpedo. Ooh, Thankfully, wow. the third senior officer, this beautiful man, refused to authorize the decision. The U.S. finalized its preparations, and I kid you not, the day before the U.S. Wow, that was this close to launching a nuke. Cuban invasion, Khrushchev was like, hey, you know if you just removed your missiles from Turkey, we'd remove ours from Cuba? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good to me. It was a bit more complicated than that, but at the last second, the two sides finally came to an agreement. Soviet missiles were shipped out of Cuba, and the world breathed one gigantic sigh of relief. Yeah, except for one was guy. this close from nuclear war. Livid. Phew! Let's hope that's the biggest crisis of my presidency. Unfortunately for him, his presidency was to end with one. Having nearly yep. blown up the planet, a few changes were made. First, the superpowers agreed to a limited test ban treaty. Secondly, the Soviets ousted Khrushchev and replaced him with Leonid Brezhnev, who was a kisser. He liked to kiss. Whoa. Both sides were deeply concerned at the prospect of nuclear war. But still, the arms race raged on throughout the 60s and 70s. U.S. intelligence worked out that the Soviets' nuclear arsenal was not as powerful as they previously thought. But in fact, it was America that held the advantage. ABMs and MIRVs were developed, and the doctrine of MAD. If both sides knew they would be completely destroyed yep, by a nuclear mutually war, assured neither destruction. would risk starting one. But even without war, it doesn't make the world sense. was already feeling the effects of nuclear weapons. In 1966, above the pleasant town of Palomares in Spain, a U.S. bomber collided with a tanker mid-air, and four hydrogen bombs fell and landed near the town below. Mm. It hasn't exploded, so I'm sure everything's fine. No. Nope. Oh boy. Uh, Probably want to hey, stay for, I wouldn't eat that away from all that radiation. Okay. What were you gonna do today? Go for a swim? Yeah, I wouldn't. Are you breathing right now? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't. It took the Americans two and a half months to find one of the bombs which had gone missing in the ocean. This was the 14th time America had lost a nuclear bomb since 1950. 14th time? Nobody knows how many Yo. bombs the Soviet Union Hold had. Hold up. So sleep well. Yo, with how dangerous these bombs are, right? Like, you'd figure that you do everything you can to keep track of them. Like, how are we losing all these bombs all over the place? Like, don't we have a system to make sure that that doesn't happen? That's crazy. Well, tonight. After Kennedy's assassination, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson took over, and he inherited a developing crisis in the East, Vietnam. Back in the 50s, mm. the Vietnamese had kicked their French colonizers out once and for all, and the country kicked was divided into out. two. In the North, a communist regime, and in the South, an anti-communist regime. Both were led by very sweet-looking old men, but don't let that deceive you. They were both ruthless dictators. Hey, and it's the sweet old men you gotta Vietnam watch. Under their own regime. So the North established the National Liberation Front, also known as the Viet Cong, to carry out a campaign of guerrilla warfare in the South with Soviet support. The U.S. sent advisors to help train the South Vietnamese to deal with the threat, but President Diem's brutal policies pushed more and more South Vietnamese to support the Viet Cong. And mm. over the next decade, the situation escalated to a breaking point. America feared the domino effect. That right. is, if South Vietnam fell to communism, they're all gonna fall. Next, just, just Thailand, gonna keep spreading. Burma, India? LVJ had to make a choice Damn, between India. losing South Vietnam or sending in the troops. And so in they went. From 1965, America found itself in a war unlike anything it had ever fought before. Let's play Spot the Viet Cong Soldier. Did you see him? Of course not. That's no. because millions of young American men were drafted and sent to fight a ruthless enemy who used the thick jungle as its shield. Right. It was nearly impossible to tell where the enemy was. Fighting in a worse, jungle and unfamiliar and result, terrain. The civilian population got right. caught up in the brutal right. crossfire. A bunch of civilians got killed. found itself under regular attack, and America launched a bombing campaign in the north during Operation Rolling Thunder. The Viet Cong used the Ho Chi Minh Trail running through Laos and Cambodia to supply the campaign. It was a long and brutal war, and I could never do it justice in this video. But in mm. terms of the Cold War, Vietnam was probably the biggest of many, many global conflicts that signaled a turning point. Right. Under the threat of nuclear war, the two superpowers began working to make their relationship more constructive. And as a result, their ideological battleship... Yeah, so again, this is the problem with what happened, right? It was like you have these two superpowers um, indirectly fighting. So they're not actually fighting on their home soil. They're fighting in other people's countries, right? And just sort of, you know, manipulating governments and in their favor so when you have these two superpowers fighting but they're not really fighting directly they're they're engaging in these proxy wars the people that got you know the shaft 
really got the shaft were the you know poor undeveloped countries where these fights were happening where whether that's vietnam whether it's iran afghanistan tunisia whatever those are the people that actually suffered right because uh because they're this is where the wars are actually taking place, where the bombs are dropping, or, or dropping, where people are actually dying in all this. Like, those are the real. This is the real tragedy of the Cold War: is what happened to those countries that got ravaged because of it, not because not what happened to, you know, the U.S. or the Soviet Union. Shifted away from the potential of direct conflict and more towards attempting to influence smaller proxy wars around the world. In the yep. Middle East, the Soviet Union provided aid against Israel during the Six Day War, and then again when the US backed Israel during the Yom Kippur War. In Africa, the Angolan Civil War saw US supported South Africans fighting Soviet supported Cubans. In the conflict between Somalia and Ethiopia, the superpowers interestingly switched sides as regimes changed, mm -hmm. and the US continued fighting the spread of communism in its own backyard, funding the famous Contra groups to fight the socialist junta in nicaragua these proxy wars were fierce enough to begin with Damn. superpower intervention amplified the destruction right. and created alarming levels Put of human suffering fuel in the fire because they're supplying Vietnam, that you know bombs guns back home all type of weapons television. resources the late 60s, america was a changing making nation. it worse this became this this became oh. this peace this movement became this the new slogan that was taking root make love not war the majority of americans did not approve of johnson's handling of the vietnam war and in 1968 a silent majority elected law and order candidate richard nixon as the vietnam war appeared richard to be increasingly nixon. unwinnable and public opinion turning increasingly sour nixon made the decision to begin bringing the troops home and ended u.s involvement in vietnam yep. by 1970 without u.s support it later, fell the south fell yep the Cold War was now taking its toll on both superpowers. In Russia, a huge percentage of the budget was still going to the military. People were still hungry, and they just didn't have access to the same lifestyle and goods as the West. And what did they have to show for it? They weren't even winning the space race anymore. Both sides needed to reduce spending in order to rescue their economies, and so both welcomed with open arms an easing of hostilities, otherwise known as détente. To improve relations, Nixon became the first U.S. president to visit Moscow in 1972, and Brezhnev returned the gesture a year later. A number of treaties were signed, including the 1972 SALT agreement that limited nuclear weapons. Relations with China were even improving via ping-pong diplomacy when the U.S. table tennis team went on a tour of the People's Republic. However, internally, China was still pushing anti-capitalist propaganda, which led to some mixed messages. Nixon even visited China in 1972, and it was a barrel of laughs. Today, the president walks among priceless treasures from China's golden age. Among them, a pair of ear stoppers used by the emperor to keep from hearing criticism. What's a pair of those stoppers? Everything was going great for Nixon, until it was uncovered that back home he was being a very naughty boy and violating constitutional protocol. Mm, I'm announcing good. today my resignation as president, and I'm passing the office to my vice president, Gerald Ford. Wow, you mean in America the people can actually remove their leader when he breaks the law? Why not just rule by force? Where's the corruption? And my first act as president is to pardon Nixon. Ah, <laughs> there it is. After the whole fiasco, Americans decided what they really wanted was just a nice safe guy who wouldn't cheat on them. So they elected Jimmy Carter and the two sides met in Vienna where they signed yet another strategic arms limitation treaty. It's an honor, Premier Brezhnev. Likewise, President Carter. Please don't do that. But that's not to say there was no longer any tension between the two sides, because there was. Heaps of it. Once again, the Soviet Union put down further attempts at reform and rebellion in the Eastern Bloc. The Euro missile crisis saw new and improved classes of intermediate range missiles being deployed in Europe. In 1979, the Soviets thought it would be a good idea if they had their own Vietnam and invaded mm. Afghanistan to prevent a US sponsored Islamic insurgency. And in response to these various crises, Olympic Games were boycotted. Conservatives were concerned that US policy had become too soft. And in mm. 1980, they decided they wanted a president who would be tough on communism so they elected ronald reagan oh, and reagan came go. in guns blazing ronald concerning reagan. the soviet union's human rights violations he made a speech calling them an evil empire and he also wanted to renew the army i think the most the most famous uh line from the cold war is definitely ronald reagan's speech where it's like mr gorbachev tear down this wall so i think this is where we're headed <laughs> 
Tracer using technological advances in computing and lasers. He came up with the Space Defense Initiative, also known as Star Wars, mm. which was basically a big defensive anti Kind of like around the Trump's country, but a lot of Space Force. It was a pretty dumb idea. The Soviet Union perceived this shift in rhetoric as the USA getting ready for war, and they were mm. feeling especially threatened as their relationship with their communist ally China had broken down. Mm. Relations took a big hit in 1983 when the Soviets shot down a Korean airliner that had strayed into their airspace, and it looked like the world was going right back to mid 20th century Cold War tension. But then Brezhnev got really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died and Damn. was replaced by Mikhail Gorbachev. Coming into office in 1985, he was the real game changer. His philosophy differed a lot from previous Soviet leaders. He felt that the reason the Soviet system and economy was struggling was that it didn't allow the Soviet people to find satisfaction in their work right. because they weren't allowed to speak freely and lived in fear. Gorbachev wanted the Soviet people yeah, to... See, that's the thing about, you know, the Soviet system is like I think like the purpose of every system of government right is to allow people to to flourish seek economic prosperity and all of that right but if your system doesn't even do that if people are always poor there's no economic prosperity it's it's just you know people can't eat then what's the point of even having the system in place it's not benefiting anyone except for the very 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 few uh, who are in power so of course people aren't going to want to follow uh, or abide by the system if it's you know if it's not helping them no what's what's even the point i know there's a lot of you know faults with capitalism in terms of like you know wealth concentration and wealth inequality and all that and where you know the top one percent has you know like 99 percent of the wealth or whatever but capitalism d does allow for some social mobility and you know, generally speaking the standard of living for people tends to go up over time especially with technological advancements and things like that and people have a sense that you know that they can get themselves out of poverty if they work hard enough right so they can become a doctor or a lawyer or entrepreneur or whatever and there's some sort of social mobility they're not just stuck in their social strata forever right but if you're in a system where you don't even feel that's possible then you know what's the point to be happy but unlike previous soviet leaders he actually made the change happen within the first couple of years he began the political movement for more openness and transparency and the restructuring of the soviet political and economic systems and change very quickly took effect people could criticize the government they could enjoy western pop culture the media mm. interviewed margaret thatcher but most importantly the soviet people could now enjoy pizza hut all hail mm. to gorbachev he also knew that the arms race needed to end in order to rescue the soviet economy and a positive relationship with the west must be established constructive dialogue dialogue reopened and resulted in the INF Treaty, which saw all intermediate range missiles eliminated, which was okay. huge. Reagan's tone towards the Soviet Union began to soften, and things were looking up. But what would these reforms mean for the Eastern Bloc? For decades, the Soviets had been brutally suppressing any attempt at change. Now, would they be allowed? And that was the exact question on Hungary's lips when the Prime Minister visited Moscow. Gorbachev's response, he didn't necessarily agree with the reforms, but he wouldn't stop them either. He was prepared to let the Eastern Bloc wow. choose its own future. This was massive. And the Hungarian leaders... Gorbachev free was like a real elections. progressive as far as, you know, and also held communist leaders are concerned. The Soviet Party, Solidarity, won 99 out of 100 seats in the Senate. But not just that. In Hungary, the barbed wire border between East and West was removed. The Iron Curtain was unraveling. But not all Eastern Bloc leaders were happy. Notably, East Germany was still ruled by a hardline Stalinist, Erich Honecker, and many East Germans were still eager to get out. They had been trapped by the Berlin Wall, but now mm. they were doing the math. If they could travel to Hungary, and Hungary's border with the West was loosening, could they now make it uh, to the West? Uh, that summer, through Hungary, East Germans yep. decided Hungary was Hungary the was a walk around to get out. They traveled there in droves, and using various methods, tens of thousands crossed the border into Austria and the West. Honecker was furious, and Bloch traveled to Hungary, but that civil liberties train had started rolling, and it wasn't stopping. Thousands more flocked to the West German Embassy in Prague, where they stormed the fence around the embassy gardens, and a temporary refugee camp was set up. In September, deals were struck to allow the refugees to travel west via train. Hmm. Back in East Germany, the people were running on a civil liberties high, and they wanted their next hit. Dissent was growing. Over time, demonstrations turned to mass protest, with protest. plain clothes secret police officers doing their best to put down the dissent, but it had grown well out of dude. their control. And worse, the biggest demonstration was yet to come. We're gonna put all of this down by force, right guys? Guys? 
Unfortunately, everyone had realized what he had not. This was bigger than them, and the entire East German Politburo voted him out of power. On November 4th, over half a million East Germans took to the streets of East Berlin. For many, there was still one big target left in their sights. That damn wall. The pressure on the East German government was too great. And on November 9th, they made a bit of a chaotic announcement that the travel ban between East and West was They're going to lift it. The change wasn't meant to take effect until the next day. And crossing guards still had orders to shoot on sight any who tried to cross. Damn. But that night, huge crowds gathered at the crossing points and the guards were overwhelmed. In an astronomically historic moment, after decades of family separation and travel restriction, the people were allowed to pass through. Mm. East and West Berliners couldn't believe it and celebrated together throughout the night some even climbed the wall and began to topple it the iron curtain had fallen and a year later germany would be reunited elections in bulgaria a peaceful revolution in czechoslovakia and a violent one in romania brought to an end communist authority in the eastern bloc mm -hmm. america decided it would be best if it just stayed away and let the change happen as the anti-communist movement continued all the way back to moscow gorbachev had given the people the freedom to demonstrate now they demonstrated for an end to the communist single party rule and gorbachev had to give in for the first time in history elections were held in which candidates not officially endorsed by the party were allowed to run ambitious mm -hmm. rival of gorbachev boris yeltsin led a growing democratic movement now things here get quite so there's even a democratic movement even growing in the Soviet, Soviet Union topic. so believe me this is oversimplified but it went a little see see that's the thing that's why you know um, the Soviet Union had to rule with fear and terror and all that because you know eventually if you give people freedoms they're gonna rebel against the system you know so you have to rule with fear and terror and keep people underneath your thumb to, to keep the system in place um, so that's that's why you know a lot of these you know communist uh, systems they have these authoritarian totalitarian type governments because that's the only way they can keep the system in place because if you give people freedom they're gonna choose something else and they're gonna rebel and protest and, and go against it so yeah a little bit like this. The Soviet Union was made up of a number of smaller Soviet republics, the largest of which was Russia. Yeltsin got himself elected the president of Russia and began a struggle for sovereignty against Gorbachev and the greater Soviet Union. Communist hardliners were horrified at what Gorbachev was allowing, so they briefly kidnapped him and tried to set up their own emergency government. But Yeltsin and his supporters all gathered around the White House in Moscow and were like, no, we have a tank. So the hardliners had to concede and released Gorbachev. Wow, thanks Boris. That was a close one. No problem. And thanks to you for all the great freedom you've given us. Any time, pal. And just to inform you, I've used that freedom you've given us to go behind your back and make a deal with Ukraine and Belarus to dissolve the Soviet Union and set up the Russian Federation. In other words, you're no longer in charge. I am. <laughs> Kick them out. Dude. I guess he can't really be so mad. He saved his so bacon. Decades of tension and the everlasting threat of nuclear war finally came to an end as democratic governments were established in many of the old wow. Soviet republics, and the world got yep. along together forever after. Right, guys? Psych. I think the biggest takeaway from this is that, you know, you can't enforce power through fear and terror because eventually, you know, that's unsustainable. People are going to revolt. Eventually, they're going to protest and they're going to, you know, try to undermine the current system is if they don't feel that the current system is, is serving them. So after Gorbachev, you know, who was real sort of like progressive as far as, you know, with with within the spectrum of communist leaders was a real progressive started, you know, peeling back some of the restrictions, allowing reforms to take place in the Eastern Bloc, you see that. People started making different choices. They wanted democratic governments. They didn't want this one party, hardline communism system anymore. And the control of the Soviet Union started to erode a little bit, you know? So once you give people choices and you give them freedom, they're gonna make the choice that, that you know, most benefits them. And if, if, you know, and I think that's the problem with, with, uh, com with communism. And eventually you see like the Soviet Union you know, they had their own rebellion uh, where people wanted to have a more democratic style of, of government. So I think the biggest takeaway is that you just cannot, you know, keep people suppressed with fear and terror indefinitely because eventually people are going to rebel. Eventually people are going to rise up and it's just ruling with fear is just unsustainable. You have to have a system that that people want to subscribe to. Right. You have to have a system in a, in a way of governance that people want 
to subscribe to otherwise it's just not gonna work so yeah with that said uh thanks for checking this out with me very educational as always and i'll catch you guys in the next one take it easy they tell me that i'm never gonna make it they want me to do something that can make sense they hate when i keep dreaming i'll be famous but i don't give a fuck i'ma keep chasing